Welcome, listeners, to today's episode of the Black Business Roundtable. I am your host, Doug Blackshear, broadcasting live from the City of Diversity, Oakland, California. We are streaming live from the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce. The Black Business Roundtable views are independent from those of the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce. I hope that you had a safe 4th of July weekend. I know those of us that were vaccinated enjoy participating in small, intimate family gatherings, something we missed out on due to the coronavirus this past year. Special thanks to Magnolia Engineering and Construction for their continued support and congratulate Tammy Willis on their new website. And that is www.magnolia.engineering and construction. C-O-N-S-T-R-U-C-T-I-O-N dot com. That's Magnolia Engineering and Construction dot com. Today's show highlights, we have a show for you today. Politics in Oakland and the David and Goliath political race for California 18th Assembly District. Congratulations, Janani Ramachandran. She has secured her name on the ballot for the runoff on August 20, or excuse me, August 31st. We will also discuss today the importance of saving the Howard Terminal from the Fisher family, billionaires and majority owners of the Oakland A's baseball team. We have both the present and the past present of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, joining us today. And let me tell you this, they are fired up ready to go and ready to light this show up. Thank you, two brothers. I am proud of them. Our guest today, as I have said continuously, Dr. Ashley, when I see you on the show, you, you relieve me. Hmm. Thank you. You, Thank you, for you help me. me take in all this that's going on. And the most important thing, I wish you were around when I was battling those billionaire companies who were trying to destroy my mind. Mm. And as we talk, if once you destroy a person's mind, then that person is defeated. So mm. thank you very much for coming on the show and your continued support on our weekly show. Thank you. Dr. Ashley is the department chair an assistant professor of psychology at University of the West. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Dr. Ashley. Thank you. Our first guest today is going to be Janani Ramachandran, Esquire. She's the candidate for California's 18th Assembly District. Let me be clear, audience. We have a political system that is being run by people who are used to um, getting paid, and I'm talking about elected officials, getting paid while their constituents get played. We need to start electing people who are not corporate representative, but the people representative. It's so important that you keep your eye on the money. Thank you. Our second guest, and third guest will be working with me together on the second half, and that's Mr. Trent Willis, president of the ILWU, and I love saying that brother's name. He's the only black man I know who shut down the Pacific Coastline. <laughs> Trent, you are my man. Right on, brother. The second, our second, or excuse me, third guest will be Melvin McKay. Melvin McKay was the past president of the ILWU Local 10. 
and this brother is dynamic too. I met him uh, at the uh, job consortium, the Valley Transporta Transportation Administration is gonna have almost a billion dollars worth of work coming up. And they had a uh, meeting last week outlining the different trades that they're going to be hiring, sub uh, subcontractor, uh, IT people, administration, et cetera. And Mr. Melvin McKay had, uh, the conversation I had with him was so intriguing that I asked him and Trent Willis to come on to the show and enlighten our people on what's really going on at that Howard Terminal. Let me be clear, Oakland is going through a huge gentrification process. And if we allow one or two billionaire to buy the most valuable land in Oakland, we will lose. We will be like San Francisco. San Francisco is 3% black now. Oakland used to be 47% black. Now we're down less than 20% black. So be sure to listen to these gentlemen. Listen, listen, listen. Thank you. Co-hosts, trans, uh, presently transitioning, traveling to much of uh, uh, July and increasing his duties with Magnolia Engineering and Construction. My brother, my friend, my collaborator, Everett Butler of Everett Butler Firm Consultant of Oakland, California. Thank you once again for being a part of the Black Business Roundtable and an ambassador to our youth. And I remember this brother when we were young. He was always helping everyone, always. Thank you, Everett. I know you're chiming in, so you're gonna have me say assalamu alaikum, my brother. <laughs> so I hope you're having a good time out there and enjoying whatever it is that you're doing out there. And I sure as deal with your family. And, and one thing you say to me that I'm gonna share our audience, we're family strong. We are gladiators. I love you, my brother. Well, Everett will be stopping in periodically also, but however, my new co-host today and moving forward is our previous guest. Everett, Mr. excuse me, Mr. Larry Lewis. Mr. Larry Lewis, thank you for stepping in and stepping up to co-host the Black Business Roundtable. I'm sure you will add a fresh perspective on the Black Business Roundtable. Welcome aboard, my brother. And as I said about Everett, Larry, ever since I've known you, over 40 years, how many people can say you know over 40 years, you've always been the beacon of light when it's relating to helping our people and being and persevering to getting what you need to do to achieve things you need to achieve in life and being a beacon of light to our people. Our people need to see winners. That's a winner right there. Welcome aboard, Larry. Thank you. I'd also like to say, we wanna mention these ladies and I've said their names continuously over the last three or four weeks. Political races, powerful women, women running in politics, hierarchy. Nina Turner out of Ohio, 11th Congressional District. This sister has a vision, and that's a vision that all people, all people should have an opportunity and be represented. Let's, you know, anyone in Ohio, please call them up and let them know, vote Nina Turner for Congressional Ohio's 11th Congressional District special election as incumbent Rep. Marcia Fudge is now serving as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development with the Biden administration. Election day is November 2nd. Voter registration is October 4th. Val Demings, 2022 Senate campaign former Orlando Police Chief seeking to unseek little Marco Rubio. And I'm using that name because that's what Trump calls him. Little Marco, get your little bags 
in your little shoes and get ready to get to step it because Val Deming is coming to represent the people of Florida. If you know anyone in Florida, be sure to pump this sister up. Sharp sister, I've seen her in the um, uh, in the House of Representatives, and she's articulate, intelligent, and she's knowledgeable, and she's ready to lead. Val Deming, Senator for Florida, we got your back. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ashley so that she can announce the news of today. It's all you, Doc. Okay, thank you, Doug. So. On this day, on July 8th, 1860, um, the ship Clotilde arrived in Mobile, Alabama, with carrying over 100 enslaved West Africans, okay? And this ship was commanded by Captain William Foster. Um, and again, this is despite having a ban on slave importation. This story is just, again, another hidden story in our history. I want to invite our listeners to go ahead and check out um, the story in more detail. And you can find that um, by accessing calendar.eji.org. So once again, our brothers and sisters uh, were brought over our ancestors um, and I just, even though it's a heart wrenching story, it is yet still a story of resilience and overcoming. And so with that, um, I'd like to transition in talking about, um, and carrying over, hoping that all of you had a wonderful, great and safe holiday weekend. Um, Doug, as you mentioned, hope you did too, brother Larry. And in that with our listeners and uh, tied in with the story, there's so much in the news happening right now. Um, and there's a theme coming up when I think about stress management, when I think about resilience, one of the things that comes to mind um, is actually what are we carrying or forgiveness? We often cannot move forward until we acknowledge what we've been through and offer forgiveness. And the forgiveness does not mean that we are okay with what has occurred, with who's hurt us, with the unfair treatment we received. But the forgiveness is also about examining the load of what we're carrying and making a decision, a concerted effort to let go. Why? because we deserve the ability to strive for our dreams, our goals, and our wishes by taking our power back, okay? And the chapters in our stories that are painful, that we maybe wouldn't want publicized, when we take ownership of those parts of our stories, we tell them in a way that frees our mind, that doesn't keep us locked in the trauma and the stress. And it can become a testimony. It can become wisdom to help others, right? And again, more importantly, gives us the opportunity to invite the light in. So as your listener, as our, um, as our dedicated listeners and for our new listeners today, you've heard stories of people who have overcome um, work abuse, targeted efforts, right, to silence voices, overcome abandonment and other types of traumas. And I'm thinking about over the weekend, maybe people, maybe you sat with family members and you hadn't had an opportunity to um, maybe make peace and then you're encountering that person. Life is short right? Just a few minutes for, for those of you in Oakland, California, in the Bay Area, and for our hosts in the Bay Area, there was an earthquake unexpectedly. Life can be rattling. It can shake us unexpectedly, but how do we respond? And so in that, whether it's hearing of a young track star who is seeking forgiveness for choices, or where's our compassion? Where's our forgiveness for ourselves? Where's our forgiveness toward others. So I want to invite our listeners to reflect 
on what you're carrying and how might forgiveness be a gift not only to you, but also to others so that you can fly. Okay. So that is a reflection uh, that is on my mind. As always, Dr. Ashley, it appears, it doesn't matter what word, but any words that come out of your, your mouth can soothe the savage beast. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're Larry, we want to turn it over to you today. Please let us know who our sponsors are and help us move forward, my brother. Good to have you on the show. And I look, I look forward to riding with you in the future. Thank you, Larry Lewis. Your mic. And, uh, is yours? Come on, Larry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Donnie Glover of BlackUSA.News and BeMoreNews.com for the opportunity to broadcast and for hosting Black Business Roundtable. Thank you. Folks, make sure you connect with Magnolia Engineering and Construction now on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. In addition, Magnolia Engineering and Construction would like to say thank you to Dr. Philip Harris of Oakland, California, who has composed our music heard from time to time on this podcast. He is an author and a member of Kappa Alpha Phi Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Visit Philip Harris Baritone at his website, philipharris.com. Thank you, Larry. Well, this is going to help us transition. Janani will be on in, I think it's three minutes. So let's bring a warm introduction to Janani. Janani Ramachandran, Esquire, California's 18th Assembly District Special Election candidate. Out of five candidates, only two made the cut. And that is, one is uh, Janani Ramachandran. The Black Business Roundtable would like to welcome back and congratulate Janani Esquire, Ram, excuse me, Janani Ramachani Chandran Esquire, whom just ran for California's 18th Assembly District and is now one of two candidates in the runoff on August 31st. Thank you to all that voted. And I want to pause right there. It is your responsibility as free people in a democratic society to vote. From my understanding, only 10 to 15 percent of registered voters voted here in this race on uh, uh, this past week. We must realize our ancestors died so that we can vote. Our ancestors wish they had the same opportunity that we have now. So be sure, if you voted, check and see if everyone in your house voted. Ask your friends if they voted, but make sure you use that valuable tool to make our city, state, and country a better place. Vote, vote, vote. Now, back on to Janani. Janani is a social justice attorney and community activist. Janani had previously served on the Oakland Public Ethics Commission and currently serves on the California Commission on Asian and Pacific Islander American Affairs. She is a graduate of Stanford University and Berkeley Law. This week, we want to talk to her about her press release and her formal complaint. Detailed how California Democratic Party endorsement process ignored conflict of interest rules, allegations of forgery, and suppressed votes in the AD18 as Assembly District 18 endorsement race. Learn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to reveal her platform. And that's Janani for California. Dot com. 
Once again, Janani for California.com. And you talk about perfect timing. And there is our next Assembly 18 re representative. And let me just say this, Janani, I don't know if you heard my first introduction. I'm going to say it one more time before I pass the baton on to you, because I know you're going to light it up, my sister. Janani is like David and Goliath's story. The other team has millions. To defeat you. Janani came in with her rock and her slingshot and she's swirling it around and she's going to slay that giant and that's that corporate giant that continuously use those corporate dollars for the few can enjoy over the many who are suffering in the city of Oakland. Janani, lay it on us, let us have it and tell us how it really is and what we should know. I'm passing and turning it over to you, my sister. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you all for having me again on the show. I love being here. I love the energy that everyone has over here and the support for my David and Goliath campaign. It's true. My opponent, Mia Banta, spent over a million dollars and still did not get 51% of the vote. That's over five times the amount of money I had in this race. Now, she, they've already started with their lies. They've texted people across the district with their smear campaign and all of that. Um, yesterday, I spoke at a pro-democracy rally, at a rally that was fighting for government transparency, rooting big corporations out of government, all of that. She hired teenagers to hold up posters with, with trying to smear me. But she doesn't realize that every attack that she tries to make makes us grow stronger, makes me grow stronger. This whole movement energizes me to make sure that we win this and defeat the ugliness that other campaigns try to hurl at you. Um, it's... It's a fact. I didn't anticipate. A lot of people say, well, you know, you're both Democrats. You're a woman of color. She's a woman of color. It's all the same. No, there's very, very little in common between the two of us. And people have a real choice to make. Are you happy with the way government works right now? Are you happy with the status quo system and the, you know, the nepotism, the hierarchies, the corruption, the large influence of corporate dollars and billionaires? If you're if that works for you, great. Then vote for the status quo candidate. But if you're ready to shake things up in our state capital, if you're ready for something different, if you're ready for to fight for equity, for racial justice, for supporting small businesses, for supporting rooting corruption out of government, then the choice is easy. So I thank you for letting me give my little spiel. I am riled up this week. It's been a it's been quite the week and we have seven and a half more to go, but uh, but I'm ready. Janani, we felt, and I say we, we felt that we needed to give you more time to articulate your position. And the reason for that is every time I turn on the TV, every time I turn on YouTube, they are running Mag, uh, I can't even, the Bonta. Now, if you can articulate, because you know we have the current and the past president from the ILWU coming on here. Can you articulate your position as it relates to the Howard Terminal and preserving those great paying jobs from a union that has a large percentage of black people? Now, I know and you know the current, or excuse me, the man who was just promoted, not elected, and I'm going to rephrase that, the man who was given the job to the state attorney general, his position on the Howard Terminal, and his wife's going to carry that same position because we know that. We know politics. What is your position? Thank you. 
I am fully opposed to the Howard Terminal Project. And I've been saying that from day one. Before people realized how much this was going to cost, before people realized uh, the gentrification and displacement and loss of jobs, early on, um, I was invited by the ILWU to visit the Howard Terminal. I got an explanation of what was going on and how this would threaten well-paying longshoremen jobs um, and other jobs as well in the port. And I took a stand and, I, and also West Oakland residents who you know showed, shared why this project is going to harm their lives. And the decision was easy in my opinion. And that's the kind of person I wanna be as a policymaker. Listen, listening to the facts and making a decision based on what community groups, especially those community groups without a voice at the table in politics, listening to what they say and taking a stance regardless of how politically unpopular that might make me. Um, and you know, it's it's really sad. I've been criticized a lot for that decision. I've, it's been great to see, of course, support as well. There's so many people um, in the black and brown communities in Oakland that are similarly opposed to this project, but a lot are just blinded by, you know, I like the A's too, you know, that I grew up going to A's games, that, that's fine. But a lot of people are so riled up by that, that they're willing to, you know, promote the interests of a billionaire family over that of Oaklanders, over that of longshoremen and um, West Oakland residents and so many other people. So the decision was easy for me to oppose the project and I have stuck with that regardless of, um, you know, what criticisms are hurled at me. And there have been a lot, unfortunately, including by other, I've been called anti-union for deciding I'm against the project. And I'm like, um, you know I'm endorsed by the ILWU, so that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know I come from a union family, so that's mm -hmm. ridiculous. But people will say whatever they want um, to get to where where they want to go. Someone, well, not someone, Mia Bonta compared me to a Trumpster yesterday. So... The name calling will continue, but again, every attack will make us stronger. Well, let me just say this. Mia Bonta is more like the Trumpsters because I remember Trump hired his whole family. What is Rob Bonta doing? Okay, that's all I'm going to say there. Um, may I ask my co-host, Larry Lewis, who is from Oakland, California, and our doctor of relaxation. If you have a question, please let's fire it off because we want our audience to know how important this seat is going to be for the right person and how terrible it's going to be for the constituents of Oakland, Alameda, uh, I believe it's part of Berkeley. San, or Leandro. San Leandro. San Leandro, I'm sorry. Please ask a question that I'm sure Dr. Ashley or Larry Lewis, what concerns you as it relates? And if you have, if you don't have any questions, I can. I have a gang of questions. So please help us enlighten and inform our audience of how important it is that the right person get this seat. Thank you. I I do have a question. Hi, Janani. Welcome back. Um, actually, you've and it's it's related to mental health, and I think our listeners um, could appreciate this. And any type of leadership position becomes criticism, and you've mentioned time and time again uh, regarding um, just the smear campaigns that you encountered, um, you know, over the past week, and what you may be anticipating hearing over the next seven weeks. What is it about, talk a little bit about your fortitude. Um, the quote that comes up for me is that um, from Tupac, they didn't know, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. So I'm just curious about, you know, what did you learn about yourself during this last week with the smear campaign and how might, what, you know, how might you take that forward um, if elected? I learned that you know, going the high road wins. You know, I choose to promote on my, all my platforms and any forum that I have, I choose to promote truth and 
um, policies. What is my vision for constituents? What is our vision for the future? Now, I will call out corruption when I see it. I will call out voter suppression and voter fraud, but I don't do anything secretly. I put everything on public blast and make it known. I don't go after people's uh, personal lives and families, and I certainly don't create lies. Uh, and that's all they have really on me because there's nothing in my background that they can actually criticize. So uh, they invented um, they invented rumors and lies. And what I learned was that voters see through that. I've gotten messages from a lot of people saying, I've gotten this, this message from the Bonta campaign. I don't believe it, I believe in you. And I'm sick of hearing these things. And I know that you're gonna be the person that drives change forward. So she can spend the two, three million dollars that she probably will be spending to attack me and we'll still and voters will see through it, especially. I mean, I know at least in Oakland, voters are better than what Miyabanda thinks that they are. People see truth. They see integrity and they don't like lies and they don't like silent smears. Thank you. Please, Larry, shoot, fire off a question because we have our next winner of Assembly 13, Assembly member, future Assembly member, Janani Ramachandra. Larry, fire away. Guys, uh, first of all, Janani, it's, it's really nice to uh, hear you and hear your views and what, you, what you're uh, preparing for our Oakland. It's been a while since I've been in the Oakland area. Uh, I don't live, I live in Southern California. Uh, however, and it's been a while since I've, uh, uh, you know, just learned a little bit about what's going on, um, with, especially with the Howard Terminal. Uh, I don't have any questions. I'm just, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm learning about what's really happening in Oakland right now. J Janani, one of the things that Larry and I can share with you back in the 80s, uh, for African-American men, it was so, and Larry, let me know if I'm wrong here. It was so challenging that a lot of our African-American men had to move out of town and out of state because it was a plague, an epidemic plague where a lot of our friends got caught up in that plague. And I won't go down that road, but what I'd like to ask from you, Janani. As we know, Oakland is suffering big time for the lack of education for our kids, the lack of economic opportunity for the adults and for our senior citizens. 70% of homelessness in Oakland are African American, and much of those are seniors. Can what is what can you enlighten our audience on your plan? to help address that. Because let me be clear, this is the Black Business Roundtable and I tell you how it is. Our mayor doesn't appear to be as concerned as I believe you will be. We've had several conversations and your idea just resonated with me. Please share that with our audience who are gonna vote you into office, thank you. You know, the many issues that I care about that impact Oakland, including homelessness, displacement of longtime Oaklanders, gentrification, um, edu public education, all of these things, so many of these things at its core is about economic opportunity, is about creation and sustenance of well paying jobs. It's about supporting small minority entrepreneurs. It's not good enough to say, all right, yes, Oakland um, has, and during the pandemic has seen this offspring of, you know, brand new business ideas and small entrepreneurs and small businesses. It's not good enough to have that idea if you don't back that up with capital, with access to capital, with legal information, um, access to attorneys, to accountants, to technical assistance, this is both with small businesses and you know new entrepreneurs as well as nonprofits. There are so many organizations in Oakland that are doing 
incredible work to address the violence in our communities, doing essential work to help individuals leave, you know, the life of violence and being gang affiliated and whatnot. But we need to support the, these interventions that do work. We need to support it with access to capital if it's a business, access to grants if it's a nonprofit, uh, with technical assistance, with access to free attorneys, to counsel. These are the things that make a difference to helping our small business economy thrive, which has been heavily impacted during the pandemic. I mean, both the number, I believe, I think close to 40% of black owned businesses across California were shut down during the pandemic. Um, not to mention because of our homelessness and displacement and housing crisis, we've lost, um, you know, we're losing every year a significant amount of our black population to start with. Um, and those are things that a state policymaker has to take into consideration. Our school system is still under federal control, uh, sorry, state control. The, for reasons involving racism, frankly, um, the state of California took over um, o Oakland Public Schools and ran up our debt from you know 30 million to over 100 million. And it's time to relieve us of that debt once and for all, so we can regain control over how we operate our schools. I'd like to ask you a question since I've said it several times. Uh, Janani Ramachandri, Esquire, why did you become an attorney? And you who have a Stanford uh, uh, undergraduate degree and a law degree from Berkeley Law, why would you choose to go into politics when you could easily have gotten one of those high paying corporate lawyer jobs and been out there thieving like some of these attorneys do. Why did you choose to go back into local, uh, become a politician and have Goliath throw rocks at you and try to break you down instead of going after those, that big money? Tell us that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly did not expect my first political race to be against the system, be against the machine in this way. I didn't even know what the machine was until, you know, a few months back when I decided to be a part of it. But that's the thing. I'm running for this seat because I'm not a politician. I'm not a career politician. I haven't spent years in the ivory towers. What I've spent my entire career on is working with people working with tenants in Oakland, working with survivors of domestic violence, working with small business owners, with people experiencing mental health crises, all of the people who are being left out of Sacramento. And during the pandemic, I saw our state laws failing our people more than ever. And our state policymakers being bought by special corporate interests and blocking the change that they kept saying they wanted to see. Um, may I ask Dr. Ashley, please help me out. Every time I throw her a ball, I, I was trying to throw a light ball. She keeps hitting them out the park. Yes. So, yeah, let's throw a fastball, but I'm sure she's going to hit it out the park. Your answer no. is tremendous. Thank they you. Are, Janani. And I have two questions, Janani. So the first question um, is, you know, recently in the news, there's been so much discussion about livable wages. And um, it was so sad recently in the grocery store, I, I saw someone just, you know, trying to get as many groceries as they can, putting things back. I know that you are campaigning um, to elevate, you know, minimum wage. Can you tell us a little bit more about those efforts? Absolutely. So firstly, let's talk about who does make minimum wages and for the longshoremen. Longshoremen will make well more than the $22 an hour that I'm proposing. Many unionized jobs make more than the minimum wage that I'm proposing. But our share of unionized jobs have decreased over the years. But also, um, people of color, black people, brown people, are the ones who are left out of unions to start with. So in addition to you know expanding the ability to have well-paying unionized jobs, we need to raise the minimum wage because 
half of Californians who live in poverty and one in three Californians do live in poverty. Half of them work a full-time job. Why should someone, I mean, no one, regardless of any reason, should be living in poverty. And we're the, we're the richest state in the nation. We're the fifth largest economy of the world. No one should be living in poverty. But if you're working 40 hours a week or more, <laughs> why are you and your family living in poverty? Because wages have remained flat. CEO bonuses have increased. The, top, the salaries for the top 5% have increased 40% over the past few decades. But wages, for the most of us, have remained completely flat or have declined. And it's time to address that. So $22 an hour, to me, doesn't come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. If wages had increased at the rate of productivity, we would mm. be at a national $24 an hour. Not even California. Mm. National $24 an hour. We can't even wow. get 15 in at the um, federal level. We haven't even reached there in California yet. (sighs) Wow. Thank you for your attention to that. Definitely as as someone who works over, you know, the 40 hours a week and just thinking about, again, the livable wages and the cost of housing in this beautiful state and where we reside. Um, Janani, you filed a formal complaint highlighting um, just kind of how, um, again, there's been some uh, ignoring of, you know, conflicts of interest and the democratic process. Can you tell us a little bit about that complaint, its status and, and what led up to that? Yeah. So in short, the democratic party has a process to, um, conduct endorsements of a candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, typically this was designed in for districts that were one Democrat versus one Republican. The party would endorse the Democrat and not the Republican or the non-party person. Um, But now, because California is mostly Democrats, the fight is not Democrat versus Republican. Certainly up here in the East Bay, the fight is between corporate Democrats and establishment Democrats versus progressives and change makers and people with integrity and honesty. And that's the divide. And take a wild guess which of those the Democratic Party wants to uphold. They want to uphold the system. And so, uh, you know, Doug here is one of the delegates in this uh, in this endorsement committee and saw how flawed this process was. My opponents, um, and I say opponents because Rob Bonta, the state attorney general, chose to personally get involved in this. So this is not a race. I often say this is not a race between me and Mia Bonta. This is a race between me and our state attorney general, Rob Bonta, which is why so many people are scared to get involved and, and scared to say anything about it. So um, in this situation, they clearly knew about this endorsement vote happening on Monday well in advance, started reaching out to delegates. And by the way, Rob Bonta reaching out to delegates is a violation of the California Democratic Party's own bylaws because he has a conflict of interest. He did not disclose these interests. His, his interests are financial. Mia Bonta winning adds $130,000 every year to his family um, uh, uh, finances, and that enriches him. And, you know, it's, it's a technicality, but that's, you know, it's a, it's a clear violation, and we need to be able to address that, period. Um, the California Pro Democratic, so that was the main part of my complaint. This is a, There's a clear conflict of interest. Why is the Democratic Party failing to investigate this? because it's our attorney general, is our attorney general above the law? Is any powerful Democrat above the law? Uh, You know, we're quick to call out Republicans for violating our ethics laws and our conflict of interest laws, but for some reason, it's our state, our democratic state attorney general, we give him a pass. And to me, that's not acceptable. And I filed this knowing that the odds are stacked against me. The Democratic Party is filled with supporters of my opponents. Um, In fact, you know, Mia Bantas very proudly said that over, you know, I won over 70% of the Democratic Party nomination. Well, that 70% of delegates were handpicked by Rob Bonta. It included, he gets to appoint a number of delegates, appointing yeah. Mia Bonta herself, appointed um, his mother-in-law, his mother, uh, campaign staff, um, former campaign staff, Uh, close allies, people that he's given political favors to, um, and other people. 
um, yeah. decision to do this. And I want, and you know, that is the conflict of interest, period. And, and Janani, uh, we have the ILWU president and past president backstage. Uh, do you mind if we bring them on? Because I, they are staunch supporters of Janani. They have your back. When I mention your name, they put their fist up like, who, who gonna mess with it? You got two strong union men who are dedicated to make, and Bonta family, your machine will run short in this election because everything Janani just said is true. You are not running against Mia. You're running against the Bonta machine. And until we stop those machines, those family dynasties of politicians, we're going to have more homelessness. We're going to have uh, uh, billionaires buying valuable property. We need, and just talking to you now has assured me, and not that I needed to be, you are the best person for that uh, job. And I think there is Mr. Melvin McKay, and I believe Trent Willis is back there. But before we get, before I let them, because I'm telling girl, they, they asked me to please let you stay on. They, they want to field questions to you so that our listeners, and our listeners are not just here in Oakland and Alameda County and the state of California, but they are across the United States and they have friends who live in Oakland, Alameda, and Sally Andrew who are going to be voting for you, Janani. You may not have the millions that the Bontas are putting up. Part of that being from the Oakland Promise, and that's another subject. But the last questions I have, and there's two very important ones before um, the man who shut down the Pacific Coast, Trent Willis, my brother, <laughs> and Melvin McKay, the past previous president. But let me just say that. Uh, and I know you have to leave, but I'd like for them to give a couple of uh, questions out before you leave. But Regarding the Oakland Coliseum, why won't the, um, and how viable, let me rephrase that, how viable do you think it would be to redo the Oakland Coliseum because these commercials that the Bontas are paying for are saying that if the rich billionaire fishing family does not get their way and put a fantasy land and put the ILWU workers out of business locally here, that they're going to move. Why won't they do, why won't they go back at the Coliseum, which is ranked fifth in the nation for its location, location, location. And the second thing is, I just recently had an issue which I found out how black I really am because the Oakland Police Department did fail to protect and serve me. What will you do to address this long-standing uh, conservatorship that Oakland has, uh, that the courts have put over Oakland, 18 years that they've been in conservatorship because they failed the citizens of Oakland. Thank you. And then I would gladly uh, ask Mr. Melvin uh, McKay and Mr. Trent Willis to get a couple of questions before you leave, and I know you got a tight schedule. So thank you. And I'll put my stuff in you. I will actually come back. I will put those questions on pause and I will come back in about 30 minutes if that's okay. I oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. And Janani, as I said previously, you are always welcome on the Black Business Roundtable podcast show. So take a break for business sake. And uh, Larry, before we introduce our next two dynamic, powerful, and one brother who can shut down the Pacific Coast, Trent Willis. Please uh, give a word for our sponsorship. Thank you, sir. Actually, I'll be um, I'll be taking this segment to to introduce, but um, want to thank Mr. Donnie Glover of BlackUSA.News and BeMoreNews.com. And be sure to tune in to Sister Biz with Nicole and Tamara on Wednesdays. And also Black USA Crypto News with Kamal Hubbard on Fridays. 
Learn more about Tammy Willis, owner of Magnolia Engineering and Construction. Please visit <laughs> www.magnoliaengineeringandconstruction.com. We want to be a part of growing with our community of Oakland, California. And now back to you, Doug. It is my honor. It is my pleasure. In this segment, we will continue our previous discussion from March 27th, 2021, and the importance of saving the Howard Terminal from the billionaire Fisher family with our returning guests. And Trent, I know you get mad when I say that. Trent Willis, president of the ILWU, the only black man I know who can shut down the Pacific coast. Trent Willis and current International Longshore and Warehouse Union President, ILWU. In addition, in addition, joining us today is the past president of the ILWU as well, Mr. Melvin McKay. Now I sit on a committee with Mr. McKay and and Melvin. May I call you Melvin? You sure can. I have heard so much about you as it relates to your political action in the Oakland East Bay Democratic Club. Now, as you know, I'm chair of labor and economic development, but I heard that if I walk in there with you, people will almost bow down and say, oh, no, no, we don't want, no, 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 whatever you, so I welcome you on the show today, sir, and we are fired up and ready to go. We want to turn it over to you and Trent, and the topics will be the Howard Terminal and how it will affect those many great paying jobs with the ILWU. And the second thing, which uh, I just wanted to throw this in, why won't the Fisher family build at the Oakland Coliseum, which will definitely stimulate economic growth in East Oakland? East Oakland looks like a third world country. And I'm talking to our uh, council people, I'm talking to our mayor. East Oakland, which is less than a mile from the Oakland airport, looks like a third world country, but you want to build a fantasy land for a billionaire that would jeopardize good paying jobs. So I'm going to stop acting like an angry black man and turn it over to the president and the past president of the ILWU. Gentlemen, take it away. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you once again for uh, inviting us uh, to be a part of the Black Business Roundtable. I enjoyed myself very much the last time I was here. I enjoyed uh, uh, your guests and, uh, and all of the people you work with. I want to send uh, solidarity shots out to all of you from the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 10. And, uh, and like you said earlier, uh, I came back and this time I brought my man with me. Uh, Brother Melvin McKay, um, who who has been a long time ILWU member, has held um, many offices as well as I, myself. And uh, yes, you're correct. Um, we do have a problem with with uh, the Oakland A's uh, proposed ballpark uh, at Howard Terminal. Uh, we understand, and and, and I'm I'm actually going to pause because I I spoke a lot the last time I was on here. I want to give uh, give give my brother Melvin McKay a chance to 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 uh, elaborate here, but I just want to say before I do that um, that the the proposed ballpark uh, we understand it to be a land grab. Uh, we understand that the, the the ballpark is just a smokescreen for what uh, the Fisher family really wants, and they want to they want to buy up uh, public land. They want to do it at a at a very cheap price. And they want to build condos and expensive housing for for rich people on the waterfront. Hey, um, you 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 said it earlier. There there is no reason not to build the ballpark right where it is right now. It's in a perfect position um, uh, as far as the 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 logistics are concerned. I mean, it's already connected to the BART station. It's right by the freeway. Um, it, there, there's no reason why the uh, why the ballpark shouldn't be built right where it is. Now it presents uh, a few different problems where they want to build it now. 
um, because first of all, it, it's going to to uh, 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 the proposed ballpark. They're proposing to build it on on uh, public land that's used for high paying, good paying union jobs. Um, and some of them, but those jobs belong to our members and other jobs belong to other unions. Uh, but that is an industrial area uh, that that should be used for high paying jobs for people to take care of their families. Um, it shouldn't be used for a, a rich man's playground okay? and, a, and, a, and a rich man's money fund. Um, and that's basically what it in a nutshell. And I'll let my I'll let my brother, uh, brother, Vice President uh, Melvin McKay elaborate on the rest. He's been our point person. Uh, when it comes to the Oakland A's uh, stadium project, he has a lot of good information to uh, to give your your audience and your and your panel today. So if I can, I want to I want to just pause and 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 and, uh, and allow my brother to speak. Thank you, brother. Let brother. me ask let, let me let me ask one one question to both of you um, before before Melvin speaks. How will it affect the cost of products if that port is shut down? And those ships have to go down to L.A., San Diego, uh, Washington. How would that affect commerce in this city and in this region? Thank you. I apologize for interrupting, but that is a very. I, I just people need to know how it's here. Uh, yeah. What happens here if they build any condominiums on any tied land trust land? The people who work adjacent to tied land trust, which is an industrial dock. The residents of that tide land will cry like hell to the city council who sells them that land to say we're making too much noise. But they come into our backyard knowing that we make noise. The study has been there. Another thing, why do the fishers not want to build at the Coliseum? There's a gentleman named Dave Caval who don't want to be in the black neighborhood, but he progresses, he progresses to be about blacks. OK, he funnels around with the community of West Oakland, some parts of East Oakland to guarantee people jobs. But as today, not one man or woman has been instituted into a, a, a school for trades to uh, apprenticeship. Uh, but there's a deadline to build this so-called stadium. But when they start talking, they talk about the condominiums and the hotel. And they forget about the remnants of the stadium. They've had three different remnants of the stadium. Three different ones, right? But they already had an EIR at the Coliseum before they started this bullshit. Excuse okay. me, miss, miss, can you let our audience know what is a EIR report, sir? Thank you. Environmental impact report. They, you and explain to, the to them what that means. I'm sorry, explain to, to our audience what that means. You go to the city and you apply for an environmental impact report study to be done where you would like to build. They did that in 2017. Okay. Then they turn around and decided to go to Chinatown. Chinatown told them to get the hell out. Then they decided to go to Laney College. Uh, the school board told them get the hell out. As you guys may not know, Dave Cabal and John Fishers are owners of charter schools. So the Oakland Unified School told them, they will pound salt, get the fuck out of here. Okay. Then they said, well, we'll go over here to where the brothers are on the waterfront. We'll take that shit over there. Knowing very well in 2016, 2015, we had to move the trucks off of the maritime streets to stop idling with their engines running so they'll have a place to go, which was Howard Terminal. When Howard Terminal closed down, it was because APL merged with SSA, Stevedore Service of America. Okay, the, the way this works today is that yard at Howard Terminal moves 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 containers a month. Those trucks are no longer on the streets. They're in a yard. It's a catch and pitch yard. But Dave Caval and them say that we do not use Howard Terminal. It's been closed. The Port of Oakland does not even speak up to tell them, no, we leased that to these people over here. Right? But there's a bullshit lie going on with the community. The brothers and sisters of West Oakland, 
North Oakland and East Oakland have a big, big surprise. The Oakland A's have no reason to use them because they're not skilled trade people. How would you pull an electrical wire with no teaching? How would you lay steps to a stadium if you were never taught? How would you lay sheetrock if you were never taught? If, in fact, this condominium, hotel, apartment building, you need skilled trade to build those buildings. They will also have to be certified. May I say this? And Mr. Trent Willa so eloquently distinguished the two. What's the difference with a skilled trade union and your union? Well, our union, our union is an industrial union. See, so they can't use me to go put no steps in. But I can move cargo. I can bring cargo to you. See, what the people of Oakland, Alameda, West Oakland, East Oakland, failed to realize, being the third busiest port in the nation, what will happen? What will happen if SSA, Stephen Doran Service of America, closes down? They move. 13% of the cargo here today. They got to go to Portland, Oregon to get their toilet paper. They got to go, what, to LA to get the doves? People are not thinking rationally. You got mom and pop stores that are open every day because their shelves are stocked. Okay? But Let I can me, tell you what. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah, I can tell you. thing here. I can tell you what would happen. The people that work on 2nd and 3rd Street and the men and women that goes to work at the waterfront, it will be a gridlock. I will not be able to go to because once those cement trucks and electrical trucks and water trucks are stationary, they're not moving for me. And when those trains come down 3rd Street, they're not them. Okay, you know, Johnny Guitar Watson came out with a record 30 years ago. When the red light's on, I ain't going to move. And that's what's going to happen down here. We're going to get knocked out. Okay, and one of the things that the city council should understand, they boast about how viable the Port of Oakland is to its community. They're ready to make a vote, yay or nay, to either have a thriving community or a goddamn baseball team that plays 40 games a year or the condominiums that the Fishers would like to build to have revenue let, off of. Let me ask you a question, and I'd like to also ask Larry and, uh, and Dr. Ashley but uh, to ask if they have any questions. But let me ask you a question. Do you know or have you identified which city council people is not informed enough to understand that they are giving public property to a billionaire who does not plan to save any good paying jobs, specifically at the Port of Oakland? And second, have they realized or do, do we need to call our local politicians and let them know this will adversely affect commerce, agricultural, shipping of goods and material, and the cost of that is going to go directly to the citizens who they say they represent. Please, sure, I can. Yeah, I can answer that question. Two of your local politicians, one named Rob Bonta, and the other name is Nancy Skinner, wrote legislation against the Tide Land Trust and finances against the city of Oakland. Now, Wait a minute, who's, who is Rob Bonta again? He's now the attorney general who was appointed by another gentleman that the ILW uh, endorsed was Gavin Newsom. And what job did he have before he was, he was appointed to district attorney 18, general? The assembly district 18 that is up for grabs Thank right you. now. Okay. Thank or you. he would like his right to have. Right. But one of the things that the politicians, you asked about who in the city council, let's talk about the port commissioners. The bullshit that they pulled on the community people here three years ago had a port commission. The community got two minutes to speak. Dave Cavell got 12 minutes for a public showing. Okay. He had a video for 12 minutes and we raised hell. How disingenuous is that 
for you to do us like this. Then it just happened again at the city council Tuesday. See, the bullshit that's going on here, the bullshit that wants a legacy before she leaves here, right? That I have the Oakland A's on the waterfront with those condominiums that put the longshoremen out of work. See, when you talk about the crime in the city of Oakland, does she care? Maybe. But has she done something? Hell no. See, so when you talk about the politicians knowing- Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Melvin. Melvin, to be politically correct, if you live in Piedmont or Montclair or anywhere where there's a large concentration of white people, the crime is doing exceptionally well. Well, that's but not if you live in the black exactly. part, there is a problem. And that's because I can get in my car and go home. Okay? I don't have to deal with you people all day. I'm at the Rotunda over here. Okay? I'm at the City Hall where they have armed guards. See, one of the things you got to understand about the city politicians here, they are afraid. No fucking person here has a backbone. They can't see past their nose. And I'll tell you why. They want to stay friends. And the community at large, 2.6 million people, will be duped. Okay? They will be duped. When Rob Bonta was interviewed by the Northern District of California, our NCDC, he agreed that he will protect Longshore waterways. Also, Nancy Skinner, she agreed she will protect the Longshore waterways. Gavin Newsom, before running for governor, sat with us. He will protect the waterways. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, yes, I will. But I see exactly when you see the three car Monty are moving the P, it ain't there. They full of shit. You know, but that's all I got to say about the Oakland A's because they've lied to the community at large and the brothers and sisters who are waiting for a job, 50 years old, sitting there waiting for the Oakland A's to give them a goddamn job. What happened to the apprenticeship program three years ago? They're still waiting. Let, let, me ask, let, let me ask the current president of the ILW um, a very important question. Back in 2000, I think it was 19 or 20, when they were going to unload hazardous material off a cruise ship onto trucks, drive that hazardous material through our community, who was it that got out there and fought? against that what was the brother's name Trent? the brother's name was well the brothers names and sisters names were the ilw local 10 34 91 and 75. so it was it was it was uh, a collaborative effort with between the ilw locals um and just to give you a little information of what happened there uh we we had a series of meetings with the employers prior uh, to that ship arriving, uh, where we put in place uh, uh, several protocols to protect our members and the passengers and everybody working out there. Uh, one of those protocols that we put in place was to to uh, uh, dump the trash uh, on the water side of the ship onto a barge and take it to a control burned uh, uh, area or, or facility uh, that was away from people so they wouldn't be exposed to uh, any COVID-19 uh, trash or materials coming off of the ship. Uh, to, you know, just like in any other situation when you're dealing with uh, big business and corporations, uh, they try to cut corners, they, they put in cost-saving measures, uh, where, but they don't care about those cost-saving measures affecting the community. So they didn't want to uh, pay for the barge to take the trash to a control burned area. And they decided that they were going to send in uh, trucks with dumpsters on them. And they were going to drive the, 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 uh, the waste through the community, uh, which was a risk to the community. Uh, the ILWU has always been the first line of defense for the community on the port. You know, so we just did what we traditionally do. Um, that's what we're there to do. Um, we have uh, we have a tight connection with the community. We've always had, you know, if you go back to 1934, uh, the 1934 general strike, uh, the, the ILWU uh, takes a lot of credit for the for the general strike. But it was the community who who made that general strike possible and the community that supported us. 
So we uh, have always been indebted to the community. Um, we're, we're not going to sit uh, and, and work our jobs on the waterfront and, and work the jobs in light of the community uh, being at, uh, at risk. You know, so we, we just did what's in our nature to do. Um, we we, we uh, started a campaign to, to stop the trash from going through uh, the community. It was successful. The community came out and, and joined us. And, and that's how we were able, just like 1934 strike, general strike, we were able to uh, we were able to be victorious in that, that situation. Let, let me ask. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Ashley. I was just going to uh, just a question. Um, given that the San Francisco Giants play at Oracle Park, we know that the Warriors left Oakland and went to the Chase Center. Oakland has always had there's been this identity struggle, per se. So we see San Francisco making moves, the waterfront, the condos, the sports and entertainment. How much and, and given this upcoming vote city council, we know July 21st, how much is Oakland in a power struggle and an identity crisis when we think of the, the impact also of gentrification? Well, if you, if you look at San Francisco and, and I can give you a, a, a perfect example, when you look at the industry that that myself and, and brother McKay works in, San Francisco used to be the, uh, the had the busiest stocks. They had all of the ships used to go to San Francisco. Um, all of those uh, warehouse docks you see lined up, those used to be full of, uh, of cargo ships. Um, and that's when cargo was was offloaded off of the ship in break bulk. Okay. Instead of, of uh, going along with the times and, and, and uh, uh, refabricating or, or redoing those docks to, to, so they would be modern uh, container ride, uh, docks and and um, uh, uh, putting cranes there and the things that are the, the, the machines that are used to offload cargo, uh, containerized cargo. San Francisco decided to go more towards tourism. Okay? Um, if San Francisco hadn't done that, uh, San Francisco would be probably the largest uh, containerized uh, dock in California, at least, or the West Coast, um, we used to have 10,500, uh, excuse me, we had uh, over 10,000 longshoremen here in the Bay Area uh, back in those days when those docks were, were working. When containerization came and the, the uh, uh, San Francisco decided not to, to uh, go in that direction fully, then Oakland uh, decided to, uh, you know, to to upgrade the docks and 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 use container cranes, and that's why most of the containerized cargo now is offloaded and loaded in Oakland. The only problem is, is Oakland is not big enough, uh, you know, as far as a land availability to, uh, you know, to to do as much volume as San Francisco could have done. So our membership now has shrunk down to. 1500 members okay so if you can imagine if san francisco uh, like i stated earlier back in the day we had 10,000 members if you can imagine if that was still the case now how many good union paying jobs would that have provided for people here in the bay area you know so you know our history tells us a lot about what's going on now you know, when when you when you challenge uh, good union paying jobs that are already there, okay, and you replace it with with, with uh, tourist driven uh, industries, you're going to get lower paying jobs. You're going to get you're going to get. Uh, and and I'm not knocking people that that uh, that you know work those jobs, but those jobs don't pay as much. They don't provide the 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 uh, benefits that most families need. Bay Area is the most uh, one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. You know, so so people here and in particular black people need to have good union paying jobs that provide benefits and and everything that families need here. Mr. Willis, Mr. McKay, I'd like to ask you a very important question before I go back to this cruise ship. Yeah. I noticed a large percentage of your members are 
African American, black. <laughs> I had a, a construction company with signatory to the laborers, carpenters, operating engineers, drywall plasters, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I noticed that was particularly scary for me as a black man. Whenever I call the union, they would send a white man or Hispanic man. I don't have a problem with that, but can you tell us the difference between <clears throat> your union who represents all people and the other unions who represent some people? Thank you. Well, I can start off by telling you it was, it was almost what I started to talk about earlier when I talked about the difference between an industrial union and a craft union. Okay, a craft union is divided by craft. And in other words, if you're a crane operator, um, that's your craft and that's what you do every day. If you're if you're a laborer, you 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 do that every day. That's your craft. In an industrial union, the the workers are hired and everyone is trained for all of the different jobs that have to do with that industry. Um, when you're talking about the longshore industry, most of our work is done uh, uh, loading and offloading containerized cargo. There's a whole lot of jobs that surround that operation, whether it be uh, equipment operators or whether it be laborers. But those jobs, are those, those the members who, who do those jobs, they interchange the jobs. Like I can be a laborer one day and then tomorrow I can be a crane operator. You know, um, we also uh, are fortunate enough to have at, at our benefit a uh, uh, union hall, which we uh, dispatch jobs in a fair manner. Um, we uh, a black woman on the waterfront makes the same amount of money as a black man, a white man, uh, uh, you know, a member of the LGBTQ community makes the same amount of money as a as you know as a man or a woman. Any everybody makes the same. We have a coastwide contract, and uh, uh, in my opinion, an industrial union is is much is is much better. Uh, to be a member of, in particular for for uh, black women and men. Well, I believe we talked about this briefly last time, but I have to say that there is over two billion dollars worth of construction going on in Oakland. At least four to five billion going on in San Francisco. Berkeley has at least a billion, and every time I drive by these jobs, I see nothing but Hispanics and white people. I am concerned that there is a effort, whether it be invisible or transparent, to not hire people of color. We got brothers and sisters running around the street saying, hey man, I make more money selling whatever I sell versus the union. And if, if I went to the union, they wouldn't hire me. That's why I'm out here doing that. What is your thoughts on that, sir? Thank you. You, you asking me or, or Brother McKay? Both Sorry, of you, because I, 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 that's one of the reasons why you are both on the show today. I want our people on the Black Business Roundtable podcast show to see men like and women. Sorry about that, Dr. Ashley. Men and a woman of color doing things, president of union, uh, 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 out there shot callers. When I signatory to the laborers, carpenters, operating engineers, and others. I didn't see brothers who looked like you who was in charge. They were more dark. Yeah, uh, uh, they were more brother, window, brother window showing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to yeah, let Brother McKay talk about that for a minute. Go ahead, brother. brother. One of the things I can say to you, this organization believes in fairness, right? Everybody gets a shot. It's a, a lottery for everybody. You know, you want a job on the waterfront, sign up for it. We do a fair and equitable hiring. We put everybody's name in a barrel like you would do up in Reno or, or Vegas, and you pull the names out of a barrel. There is no nepotism here, okay? And I'm going to tell you what happens in this line of people. We get every ethnicity who would like to work, and we treat them as brothers and sisters. Just today, you can't talk to my brother any kind of way. And think I'm gonna stand by and say because you're a superintendent, it's okay with me, because it's not. And I was protecting a, I want to say Latino. I don't know because I'm not into that, right? It was a person that works on the waterfront, 
but there's respect that goes a long ways. And we are all said. I'll pick the next day I'm on the dock. The next day I'm lashing. But guess what? I'm providing for my family. I'm not that goddamn stuck up that I can't do the job that we were handed. Okay? We do whatever it takes to settle it to provide for your family on the waterfront. And everybody gets a shot because it starts on zero and ends at 100 and starts back on zero again. So you got to be in that call if you want to work. Okay? Nothing's given out of the back door. Nothing's given to the meat locker. Be in the call. You are in rotation. All you got to be right. there to accept your job and go to work if you want to get paid. That's everyone. Yeah, and we we also want to reiterate that uh, uh, we understand with that the ILWU that no matter where, uh, what industry you're talking about, or, or what part of the, the world you're 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 surfing through, a black man is always going to have a struggle. Even though we have a strong union that that is uh, roughly around seventy three percent black, we still have our struggles when when we're dealing with the employers. We still have our, our employers that treat us differently from other areas, uh, meaning like the Pacific Northwest uh, that is predominantly white. And then you have the, uh, the Southern California ports uh, that are predominantly uh, uh, Latin. And, and we get treated much different here in the Bay Area. And there's always a, a constant battle uh, to be treated equally and, and to be treated with, with respect. Um, that's why the, the platforms like this, the Black Business Roundtable, and the work that uh, that even you do, Doug, as, as far as making sure that uh, 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 black uh, businesses get shots at these uh, these construction contracts, that's that's all important work that has to be done. We we do the brother McKay and myself do the same thing with the w within our union. We make sure that our our black members. Uh, as well as every other member uh, that, that comes into our organization has a fair shake at making a living okay? and, 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 and being a part of our benefits package okay? and, and, and being and, and, you know, able to, to work under the same conditions as everybody, everyone else. But that is, that is a constant struggle every day. Uh, Brother McKay even mentioned it even as, as soon as today. Um, you know, we, we're, we're constantly always having to, to fight for our respect and, and our dignity uh, when it comes to the employers. Okay? And, when, and when you when you look at it uh, realistically, even if, if the ILWU uh, in the Bay Area was predominantly white, just because the, the, that we're, we're a labor force, you still have to fight for uh, respect and equal uh, pay and all of that. So when 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 you're a black labor force, it gets it gets even harder, just like everything else in, in this society. Uh, Mr. Willis, Mr. McKay, let me tell you something. The ILWU Local 10 is blessed and honored to have you leading the charge because I can say this and I don't have to worry about any repercussions. The man who was running against you, if he wore the president right now, they'd be building a ballpark right now. So thank you. Goddamn thank right. you. Yeah, okay. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. That's Mr. Right. Trent Willis, thank you. Mr. Uh, Melvin McKay, thank you. Now I want to transition to another story, and I'm hoping she comes back. In the last week, I saw you guys at the uh, outreach for the VTA in uh, Oakland at the Lynn Turner and uh, LaTanya Hawkins Construction Resource Center. They hosted an outreach. I saw you gentlemen there. Ken, two things. First off, explain to our audience why you both were there because I have two powerhouses in the house. I felt like if the house caught on fire, you guys could blow the fire out first. Second, what is your position as it relates to uh, Janani Ramachandran, who is going to win against Goliath? What is your position and why, if you are, why are you supporting her? Thank you. Go ahead, Brother McKay. Listen, I, I look at people as statues. She's a statue, okay? She's a person of means. 
she won me over when I heard her speak on the East Bay Democratic Club. Okay, when I heard that, I called Trent and said, Trent, this is the person we got to get behind. I'm the president of the Northern California District Council, which does uh, a lot of the endorsements for legislation uh, for Washington, D.C. Washington, D. and Sacramento. I told Trent, we have to get behind this. So Trent came to the office and I gave him uh, her literature. And he said, wow, I heard about her, right? This is an honest person. She's uh, a person of color, as far as I'm concerned. She's a woman. She's leading the charge and she's honest, right? She's not about politics, right? Uh, dark money, she will not take, okay? She's on her own. Okay, so we have to have, as I told you guys once before, boots on the ground for a person of means. Okay, this is a diamond in the rough. Okay, and for a person to know as much as she knows about the waterfront, the politics are surrounding the waterfront, uh, dealing with uh, now down and dirty people, she's got to get in the mud with them. Okay, that's the only way she's going to understand. You got to fight fire with fire, and this is a spitfire. Okay, I do believe in her cause. When she told me, I do not take any corporate money. I go, pardon me. I I will not take any corporate money. Matter of fact, I had to send back corporate money. That's fantastic with me because you can't buy her. Okay. So she, her coffee was 120,000. Mia bounced to 1 million. And the question was asked because I interviewed all of them, all the candidates that was running for D18. I interviewed them. And yeah, I, I mean, what's wrong with it? Well, you're being holding to them now. They give you a check of $6,000 with a question behind it. Would you? Could you? Just think about it. Are you going to? Because there's more where that came from. See, I, I know from dealing with politics for quite a while, I see something in a person who wants to energize the Bay Area. Finally, okay, because a person can promise you the world and give you nothing. But I got a person who will not take from the rich and willing to put her first foot forward. I told my brother Trent, we got to get behind this lady. And he did. That's why we were at the Turner Group, okay, because we're showing support for this lady, okay. We go out and put signs and door hangers for a person we believe in. Okay, and we're not through, brother. As you just said, uh, brother Doug, when she wins, when she will win, when she wins, we will dance in the street, and she will. Okay, yeah. and, and the ILWU behind Miss Ramachandran, it shows the world that there is a possibility she will win. She came from nowhere to number two. Hello, that's uh chicken -huh. uh -huh. ass. Yeah. All right. And there, there, there's a definite reason for that, too, because one thing that we believe in uh, here with the ILWU is we believe in bottom up leadership. Now, one of the one of the biggest problems with society right now and in particular in our area is too much top down leadership. OK, it is clear even when you're talking about the, the proposed uh, Oakland A's ballpark at Howard Terminal. Seventy over 70 percent of the citizens in Oakland do not want that stadium built at Howard Terminal, okay? So if, if this was a bottom-up situation, it would already be a wrap. We wouldn't even be having this discussion because the people have already spoken, okay? What you are seeing, though, you are seeing top-down leadership that is being influenced by a billionaire is what you're seeing, and you and you getting politicians um, who I'm not going to name anybody specifically, but you got you got certain politicians who who would rather listen to this billionaire because the billionaire has money rather than listen to the people. And then when you add the fact that the majority of those people are people of color in that district, okay, when when you when you add the fact that th those the people in that district already have issues that have not been addressed, like the pollution coming from the port, okay. And the, the people, when you when you add the fact that the people in this district are not being listened to at all in favor of one man because he has billions of dollars one and man. he wants to build a ballpark for his friends. So, uh, you know, and, and, and 
you and you have a mayor who 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 is more concerned about her her legacy than she is with serving the people then that's where you have a problem you have a top down problem and and the candidate that we support doesn't have that problem okay she is for the people the IOW recognizes that and we're going to back candidates that are for the people thank you I Ken. have to you, you know um and I'm sure Melvin McKay me and him and we got our hand on the trigger so <laughs> do I need to name them off or would you like to uh Mr. McKay because I, I have got to say this and then we're going to go for a quick two minute break and then bring Janani Ramachandran mm -hmm. Let you, let, they, let your nanny speak. Okay. Yes. I love <laughs> listening to her talk. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're gonna we, we're gonna do our break later. Go ahead, Janani. Step in with hey with, with your right wing man and your left wing man. Go ahead. I am really so proud and so honored to be supported by the ILWU. And it's my campaign slogan is fearless in the fight for justice. And that's exactly what ILWU has been for decades, for generations. And there's a reason we found each other and decided to work together for justice, to fight against the establishment and status quo. And that's how we are going to win this. Janani, uh, ILWU president and past president, would you like to ask our new assembly person, or excuse me, our future new assembly person, any questions? If not, I, I have, I keep pressing for it, but she has been knocking it out of the park. Larry and uh, Dr. Ashley, please, help, let's prep our audience on the facts, not the fiction, the politics, not the politics what's going on thank you well she she talked about it a little bit earlier when she was on when she talked about the even the people that she's running against um <coughs> well, uh, with, the ilw has already had experience with 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 the people she named um we we supported nancy skinner um uh before and we ended up you know um not getting a favorable uh <laughs> you know we we ended up not getting what we needed out of her we supported rob bonta before and and he ended up not being what he was about um when it when it came to uh, uh supporting the ilw and our needs so um we understand that you know we have to support candidates who uh you'll cater to the community because we're, we're we're all about the community um, I said it earlier, we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the community. Okay, the, the, the community is who a candidate is supposed to represent and, and even an elected official. Um, a lot of this is mixed up and it's so mixed up that, that people in the community have gotten used to the way it is. But we have to start pounding in people's heads uh, how it's supposed to be. And the people are supposed to run the city not the city council and not the mayor, okay? not uh, uh, Gavin Newsom. He's supposed to listen to the citizens also. You, you, don't, you don't go sit up in a big house on the hill and start acting like you can't hear anymore. Okay? And, and S Sister Janani is not, she's not doing that. She's listening to the people. She's listening to the cries of the people. Okay? And that's what a representative is supposed to do. The IOW recognizes that she's doing what she's supposed to do, and we're, we're going to support her 100%. The IOW Local 10 is going to support her 100%, and the, and the district council. That's right. right. Sister uh, Ash, Dr. Ash, excuse me. I would like to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Larry, you next. We have, oh, please, I'm not running the show, but I'd like to hear from you. <laughs> you you cut You're out a, a little bit. Yeah, yes. You said you would like to hear from me. Yes, and then Larry. Yeah, absolutely. One of the questions I think I have and just thinking of the generation about the jobs. Again, going back to that little I the question I referenced earlier about the identity. 
how can we mobilize, um, you know, millennials and younger individuals to really safeguard the essence of our community, which is the labor force, right? And actually push for the demand for the apprentice programs. That I think is um, missing. I know Janani is highlighting that, but how can we, again, get our youth to understand why these apprenticeship programs are necessary, how to make sure that the billionaires that are coming into our city are held accountable and are following through with their platforms versus just giving lip service and then um, catering to wealthy newcomers. Well, it, it, it's in our messaging. You know, when it's, it's the same strategy we use within, within our union. We, we message to our, we have a lot of young uh, uh, members that are joining the ILW right now. And if we don't teach them our, our guiding principles and, and our way of life, then it's, it gets lost. So o over the generations, we have been successful in teaching our, our younger members the, the ILW way. Um, we, we need to do the same thing in the community. You know, even when you're talking about uh, community benefits, right? How is it a community benefit when you're using my own money and giving it back to me and saying it's a benefit? That's that's not a benefit. A benefit would be to to build a jobs training center at Howard Terminal or or to to or to uh, uh, to do something that benefits the community. Spend the money and do something that actually benefits the community. You know, and, and we have to we have to spread that message. You know, along with the other messages that we're spreading, we're we're opposed to the to the uh, proposed stadium, but we, we're 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 not opposed to to using the uh, the city and county's money to benefit the people that live in the city and county. Okay, so so the whole the, this whole setup where we're talking about spending twelve billion dollars, twelve billion dollars to benefit one family who is already billionaires. Okay, my, my, my brother talked about it earlier. He talked about the, uh, the chartered schools. Uh, I believe uh, the Fisher family owns the Gap and, and, uh, and, a, and a few other uh, chain stores. Um, if anything, instead of getting a gift from the city where they can build their high priced condos, they need to be contributing to the to the the benefits of the city that the that the citizens need you you talked about it earlier doug you talked about uh, uh some of the areas in oakland looking like a third world country well you know when as as much money as oakland is generating that shouldn't be you 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 shouldn't have rich areas and poor areas okay that's that means that that funds and opportunities are not being distributed equally that's what that means. That's called gentrification, okay? And the ballpark is a part of, of, of a piece of gentrification that's happening right in front of our faces. It's, it's happening in Berkeley, it's happening in Richmond, it's happening in Oakland, it's happening in Hayward. You can't hardly afford a house around here. That's, that's some purposely inflicted wounds. Okay, and, and we, when, we're, when we're talking about these things, we need to, we need to we need to voice that in our message. That's that's why I like listening to, to Janani talk, because she's talking about uh, being elected into office and making sure that the community actually does benefit uh, from from what I call the real CBA. And it's 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 the community benefits that, you know, we haven't been getting. It's almost like reparations. You know, this this city owes the community reparations. They know they, they, we don't need a ballpark. We, we need assistance for our community members who are downtrodden and, and, and who, who are basically living on the street. Mr. Willis, when you do run, I'm going to be your campaign manager because, brother, you sound good. Now, Janani, um, does anyone have any more questions for Janani? Because I have a very important question for all of us here. And Bye. Janani, this... This is for you. How can we, all of us Davids on this podcast, our audience out there, tell us 
We're just poor people. We're not billionaires. We're not being funded by billionaires. Our husband or wives aren't the state attorney generals. We're not slinging mud. Tell us how we can help you help us. Help me help you help us. Tell us, sister, because we, well, I don't know about these people, and I'm sure they are, but I'm on the wagon. And I think you know that because in the last Alameda County Democratic Central Committee, I dropped a bomb on them. So tell us how we can we can continue to make sure that you successfully win this election. Thank you. There are so many things we can do in the next seven and a half weeks. Firstly, you have a link to my website. If you can and have the ability, I would really, really appreciate appreciate contributions. You know, this is a people powered campaign. We're not accepting money from the billionaire corporate developers and um, oil and gas industries and, you know, the folks that control politics in Sacramento and prevent minority owned businesses from getting a seat at the table. So we do rely on you to be able to fund our campaign enough to spread the word. We have over 280,000 registered voters in this district, but only 20% showed up to vote in the last special election. So we need the funds to tell people that there is a special election happening. And we know where most of that 20% of voters coming is coming from. It certainly is not the Flatlands. It's people with the privilege and the money and know-how that are electing our officials. And we need more to spread the word to more people so they know that there is an option out here that's not maintaining the stat status quo. Um, secondly, every Saturday and Sunday, we are canvassing. Um, we meet at Athol Plaza by Lake Merritt, right by the Luckies. We are there every Saturday and Sunday at 11 a.m. If you have this free hour, hour and a half, and you want to help us spread the word, um, come by and we will give you some materials to canvas the neighborhood of your choice. Um, reach out to us on the website. There's a link to um, our email to contact us. You can request a yard sign, a window poster, whatever it is for you, your neighbors, your cousins, your anyone that you know in Oakland, Alameda, or San Leandro to help us spread the word. Those signs really do help, and uh, we invite you to help us spread the word. But also telling people, not only through, uh, through social media, through texting people, picking up the phone and calling people, hey, have you heard about the special election on August 31st? You know who you should consider voting for? Um, those phone calls, emails, text messages really, really help. So those are some of the ways that you can help spread the word. And, you know, all the people right here on this call have done so much for my campaign to help me get this far. And I just need to say thank you. We're not through, Janani. But I want you to understand, like I told you the other night, we're going to start from San Leandro 150th and work our way back inland. Okay? we got to let those people on that hill understand who's running for District 18, okay? And we got to get there. And I mean, we got to do it now, okay? We can't wait till the last week. Those people got to be informed. They got to be able to educate themselves on who it is running, okay? Not the last minute when somebody says, oh, you know, I heard about uh, me about this. She's really good, but don't know shit about her. <laughs> so we got to get boots on the ground, okay? Oh, Fuck up this all the time, okay? We got to get out here and spread the word, okay? We still got DAG. We got Brookfield, we got Sobrani, we got Elmhurst, we got Emores Cox, we got all these places to hit, okay? And we're gonna stow back to Alameda and kick them in the ass over there again. Right, and also we got to understand too that it, that the work doesn't stop after after uh, the victory party. Okay, the candidates need the most support after they're elected. Okay, because we have to be the support that they they the strength that they need to go in and make the change when when the a so-called power structure knows that Janani has the power of the people behind her. They'll listen to her when she, when, when she's speaking to them. We have to understand. Then, then you the, just, just to, to, to uh, elaborate a little more on your, on your question, sister, that you, that you asked earlier. Um, we're, we're kind of, this is what we're doing right now. We, we, we have people on here that have connections. 
See, my, my brother Melvin McKay had a connection. I'm, I'm right. his connection. And he talked about how he brought this sister's information to me. And then I was impressed. So then I started reaching out to my connections. Okay. We, we just recently swore in Sister Angela Davis uh, as an honorary member uh, of our local. Um, that was a huge event. It was a very exciting event. And we made sure we invited Sister Janani to that to that event so that she can meet uh, people like Angela Davis uh, that, that will support her. We made sure, I made sure that she met my little sister who who is the CEO <laughs> of Magnolia uh, Engineering and Construction. Okay, she needs to make those, those connections because a lot of times we underestimate ourselves. We are more powerful than we think we are. Okay, there are, there are a lot of people that know Brother Melvin McKay. There are a lot of people that know Brother Art Blackshear. There are a lot of people that know you, you know, and 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 the more that we talk and, and we create these connections, those connections become very, very powerful once they once they all connect together. And we, and we also got to have the right talking points. Well, Janani, I know you have a lot of stuff you have to run and do, but let me tell you something, sister. You got a posse and I've always heard you're going to you're going to have a thousand people. And they can be disloyal bandits, and one of them is going to shank you in the back. Or you can have 10 loyal people who will crawl to make sure you make it over the field, over the finish line. And that's what you have. We appreciate you being on this show, and we look forward for you coming back on next week. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. And Brother Blackshirt, <laughs> Brother Blackshirt. If I can, if I can make uh, um, a, a comment, we we have a sister that we backed um, for District Three, uh, Sister Carol Fife. No, uh, right. She needs our support now. Now, now that she's elected, she needs our support to go do the do the the very crucial uh, community work that that she uh, that she campaigned on. Um, uh, if, if I understand it correctly, she's she's uh, starting to get a lot of backlash and a lot of pressure uh, from the establishment because of uh, some of the positions that she stands on. Mm. And and she needs she this is when she needs our support. You know, the more she needs more support now than she needed when she was running. Brother Trent, let me just tell you this. I sat on several committees with Carol Fipes. Uh, I remember when she went back to Washington, D.C. to um, work on being a Democratic uh, representative for the California area. And uh, also we sat on the NAACP executive board um, together. I will reach out to her and ask her to come on the show because mm -hmm. United and looking at this stage here, Dr. Ashley, Larry Lewis, uh, Trent Willis, man who shut down the Pacific coast and uh, <laughs> Melvin um, uh, McKay, we, we have power right mm -hmm. here. And each one of us going to link out and have established other power with our network or, uh, and, and affiliation. And that's how we're going to make change for people who look like everybody on this screen here. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Melvin McKay. Yeah. And thank you, Trent Willis. We ask you humbly to, uh, whenever you're free or want to come back, and specifically with Carol Fikes, because as I understand it, Carol Fikes is the you is the council person in the district in which you guys have your local or your uh, a lot, most of your work, the, the port. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, you are. So I want to make sure when she comes back on, you guys come back on because if you guys are giving her her props, that's good enough for me. You got my email. That's like, that's like having a black American <laughs> Express card. Hello. And then we'll, we'll always be happy to come back on. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to thank you and your panel for, for having us on today. And, uh, you know, the one of the most important things, as you can see, is leading by example when you're mm -hmm. talking about uh, uh, influencing young people. Mm -hmm. To see me and Brother McKay working together, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two strong black men, uh, our, our black youth need to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. We show our members that every day. Um, and, and you know, we're going to continue to work together. We're going to continue right. to, to make these connections. 
we're, we're going to keep fighting until we win. And mm -hmm. we will win because we oh, have yes. the power of the people behind us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Trent Willis of the ILWU and past President Melvin McKay of ILWU Local 10. And also Melvin McKay is a very powerful figure mm -hmm. in the Oakland East Bay Democratic Club, which I am proud to be a member of. And I'm asking all of you to join. We look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm. I'd like to turn it over for Dr. Ashley to uh, give us the supporting uh, minority owned business spotlight moment. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So today we want to highlight Basue Collection of Wines. The director, Mina Palivan, wants to invite the wine connoisseurs to partake responsibly in their wine collection, including a vintage wine by singer John Legend. Okay, and so uh, Mina wants to also invite you to become a Wine Society member. Members get 20% off on Bossway Collection Wines, and it is free to sign up and become a member. Please contact Miss Mina at tastewithmina at gmail.com. And don't remember, just don't forget, you can also stock up on early gifts that you didn't give um, during the holiday season and get ready for holiday 2021 or if Christmas comes in July. Dr. Ashley, this show would not be this show if you weren't here. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Oh, and I'd you. also like to thank my new co-host, Larry Lewis, retired military veteran of 20 years, an educator extraordinaire, special guest, Dr. Ashley Coleman, doctor of psychology, doctor of relaxation. Thank you, Doc. Congratulations once again on your upcoming show. But Thank please you. save time for us on this show because uh, since Trent and uh, Melvin are here. And Larry and I have discussed this at great length. Black people have been tormented, not just physically, but mentally for centuries by other people. And it is critical that we strengthen our mind. So when we get back into the game and I say the man, and if it applies to you, then you're the man. When you try to destroy us, take our fortitude, take our psychology away, make us slaves, we have the mindset. And doctor, that's why you are so important. Black people, stop being afraid of saying, hey, I gotta go, I gotta go see my psychologist today. I gotta go see my therapist. It's okay. The mind games that have plagued this group of people, black people specifically. We cannot win if we have weak mind. So Dr. Ashley, please continue to keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate you. And I'm one who used to say, oh, I'm not going to go see a psychiatrist. I'm not crazy. But yes, if it wasn't for you, I would be crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Thank you. Uh, special thanks to Janani Ramachandran, Esquire, candidate for California 18th Assembly District and securing a place in the runoff election on uh, August 31st. Mr. Trent Willis and current president of the ILWU, the brother who can shut down the, I love saying that Trent, so you, you gotta, we gotta let me go with that one. The brother who shut down the Pacific Coast and Mr. Melvin McKay, past president of the ILWU, for their participation today. Let me be clear, gentlemen. The people who are on this screen, you have no idea how we impact that next generation who look up and see people like Dr. Ashley, like Larry Lewis, like Trent Willard, and like Melvin K. People in positions of power. We are not any longer going to be, to be presidents. We're going to be CEOs. 
We're going to be black women owned engineering and construction company. And just a sidebar note for that, Tammy Willis right now was looking at two possible. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Willis. You must know Ms. Willis. <laughs> but Tammy Willis is right now working with several people, uh, large companies on some uh, upcoming contracts on some large projects. So keep her in your prayers, keep her in your thoughts. And just remember, Black women, according to Wells Fargo study, has been the best business in America. Black women own business to be successful out of every other business, and that including rich white men. Thank you. Most important, a special shout out to Donnie Glover, my brother from another mother. He's currently sick right now. Uh, he's been on his back for the last couple of days. So let's make sure we get a prayer out for him. And Donnie, I know you always watch because you keep your eye on the ball. And because of your dedication to communication for BlackUSA.news, when you hear Black Business Roundtable, Sister Biz, Crypto, uh, uh, Coin Crypto with my brother, Kamal Hubbard, uh, and the other shows that are on this network, you're hearing the real news, not the watered down news. You're hearing the real black news. And until we start hearing the real news, we're still lost, lost sheep in America. So tune in to blackusa.news. I'd like to say, Dr. Assey, would you like to give us some encouraging words to help us mentally fight that fight that all black people fight every day when they're either at work or in light of Trump air, there's still an air of racism. I don't know if you guys feel it, but that, that, that air of, uh, of entitlement. Can you give us some last words that will help us move forward before we have another dose of you next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our guests. And I want to connect it to the first story of, again, the today in the news of the arrival in 1860 of uh, the ship in Mobile, Alabama. We are resilient people and remembering that, remembering the values that we carry and the reason why we do what we do. We reach back and we pull forward. And today we I've been really grateful again to share space with you all, but to hear about how people are operating on the front lines and even as they're elevated in positions of leadership are still being courageous and bold and speaking for um, those who are voiceless. And it's a responsibility again um, and as Sister Janani talks about her background of immigrants and, and parents and that foundation, remembering the values, we have a purpose and don't let anyone thwart that. They may throw shame, they may throw shade, um, but again, remember those values and connect to why, why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> that was me having technical difficulties. Larry, would you like to give us a few words, closing thought? First of all, I'd like to say, you know, I'm glad to be here. I enjoyed this. I loved it. Gentlemen, uh, Trent and Melvin, you guys, you brought such great passion. And I'm glad to see that you're in this fight with us. All right. Because I, I enjoy just your, 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 your fire. All right. It was just, it was awesome. What we are doing, I've been reading Donnie Glover's book, Donnie, 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 uh, Donnie's last name, Glover, I think it is. I've been reading Donnie's book and uh, on, on I Am Black Wall Street. This is what we're doing right now. This is exactly what we're doing, all right? And until we do what we're doing, we're not gonna move much further. We have a, a roadmap that's been established and set up for us from way back. And, and as he was mentioning in his book, this is not just um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Black Wall Street has been happening all over our country in different places. That's what we're forming right now, right? From every different aspect, 
I had to learn, you guys have been teaching me today about, um, about uh, basically dock workers and what's, ha what's happening uh, with uh, uh, your, your occupation. And I'm familiar with it only to the uh, respect that my father in 1965 came out here to shipyards to work. And so it's been that long. So I'm connecting a lot of the things that you're saying. This is all new. You got to remember, I haven't been in Oakland in 40 years since I left in high school. Right? I go back to see my kids, all four of my children went out to the Bay Area to go to school, to go to college. All right? And that's and my grandson's out. But I haven't had an opportunity to really hear and learn. And like I was telling you guys before, um, the military, the Marine Corps took me 20 years away from everything. And, now, and then when I came back, now I have to learn all over again what's really going on in the city. So I enjoy this. I appreciate y'all. And uh, I'm looking forward to keep on growing. I, you would not believe how many notes I got here. <laughs> Kim told me to slow down, stop moving around because I'm writing everything. I got I got 100 questions. I got all kind of research I have to do. So <laughs> praise God. Larry, let me just tell you that I look forward to working with you and educating our audience and our people on what's going on. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. And remember, together we can listen, we can learn, and share because I know you care. This is Doug of the Black Business Roundtable. God bless you all and good night. Thank you.